Okay, it's time to start tonight. We are in Isaiah chapter 65, and we are going to begin in verse number 8. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Uh, finish this chapter, one chapter to go, so uh, probably this week and next week, and we'll have it done, and then we'll do something else after that until the end of the quarter. But right now, Isaiah 65, 8, um, it's really, we've been kind of one big long discussion going back to the previous chapter. In chapter 64, that's the last time that Judah speaks uh, in the book. It's Isaiah writing, he's writing on behalf of Judah. Uh, and it starts out with them kind of in denial and angry and bitter over the punishment God's going to give them for their sins. And then it's going to end with them kind of uh, repenting and, and admitting their fault and, and confessing their uh, deservingness to be destroyed. Um, and then you start 65 where God speaks and he will speak for the whole rest of this chapter and all the next chapter and that will finish the book. But the summary of it basically is we sinned. God, the, the people say to God, we sinned, you're angry. We deserve to die. And then the chapter begins with God saying, yes, you did. Yes, I am. Yes, you do. But, 65 verse 8, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, as, and one says, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. They say we deserve to be destroyed, and God says, well, it just so happens, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy it. not all of you, I'm going to destroy a lot of you. I'm going to burn the fat off. I'm going to cull the herd. Going there. This is not going to be the wholesale end of Judah, but it is, when they go into exile, going to be um, the end of what they were and the start of what they will become, which is uh, a bit more fitting to receive the Messiah. You know, it's funny. Critics um, try to pee and get a mood change. He just is the same God that he's always been and ever shall be. It's just he treats his people in a certain way over here versus over here because they're different. The circumstances are different. This is more of a national thing with, you know, they have an economy and they have taxes and they have a government and they have kings and armies. He has to deal with them in a certain way, all to kind of paint a picture in broad strokes of what things will look like in the spiritual realm, which is the realm we exist in today. Um, and in and, and that frame of mind, look at the top of the verse here, verse number eight. He compares Judah to a small cluster of grapes. My Bible says new wine. Does anybody's Bible say grapes or vineyard or anything like that? What do you have there? New, wine. new cluster. You, wine. New cluster? Cluster? Okay, new wine. Yeah. So it's not like grapes plucked, squeezed, drunk. It's still on the vine. If you remember way back, I think it was chapter five, uh, it's the, the poem or the song that God sings about his people. Um, my Lord has a vineyard. On a very fruitful hill, he plants this vineyard. He, he uh, frames it out, you know, makes a little hedge around it. Takes perfect care of it. He grows, he cultivates, and he plucks his grapes and he drinks, and it's sour. They produce sour wines. I did all this work, and I got sour grapes. And that's how God views His nation. I did all this work to cultivate you and to carve out a land for you and to give you all the ingredients you needed to be prosperous. And you're sour. You're you're bad wines. You're spoiled milk. In other words, so here you you kind of have a call back to that. God says, this grapes found on the cluster of the vineyard, don't destroy it. There's sour all around it, but there's something good there. There's a nugget of goodness that I can use. I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not going to destroy them all. Well, if you say that, it implies you destroy it a lot, but not all. Verse 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. And my elect shall inherit it, and my servant shall dwell there. His purpose for saving them is here. He sees a remnant. He sees that remnant as a seed that will sprout out of Judah's ground. This remnant that will inherit his mountains. Again, a callback. And here at the end of the book, we're getting a lot of echoes to the beginning of the book. Chapter 2, you have this beautiful mountain picture where all nations will flow into it, and the word of God will flow out of it. Here, this is my people that will inherit that mountain. It's not the physical mountain, like you have to go to physical Jerusalem and scale physical Zion and plant a flag with a little cross there to be holy. No, that's not what it's like. It's, it's a metaphorical mountain where the picture that the people have of Mount Zion, the picture have of the mountains of Jerusalem, is the template for that metaphor. It's, it's, it's the visual idea of what he's going to give you spiritually. My people will inherit that in a spiritual sense. My elect shall inherit it. Who is God's elect? Who is God's, the word means chosen, those who have obeyed him through his son that he will send. And they will be his servants, and they will dwell there in fellowship with him. Verse 10. 
and Sharon shall be a field, sorry, shall be a fold of flocks. And the valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. Sharon is this beautiful plain between Mount Carmel and Joppa. And it's the same area that earlier in this book, at the beginning of the book, as, I, as Isaiah is talking about how God's going to punish the land, he says the beautiful plains of Sharon will be a wasteland. I'm going to take this beautiful green land, I'm going to burn it down, I'm going to scorch the earth with it. It's not going to be a place for lambs and goats and things. It's going to be a place for jackals and snakes and hyenas to prowl. It's going to be a wasteland. Uh, now, he says, it's going to come back to being a fold of flocks. The Valley of Achor, that's west of the Dead Sea, is now going to be a place no longer destroyed, but a place for herds of sheep to lie down in. So you have this safe haven metaphor. You have this beautiful cultivating land metaphor. The opposite, on purpose, the mirror opposite flat difference between what it were and what they will be. What they were is this destroyed land, wasted, destroyed, uh, um, ruined because of their sin. This is what your punishment, uh, this is what your sins have brought upon you. My punishment, destroying it. But this is what my mercy, my grace will give to you. Restoration, a new beginning, a starting over. And that theme continues throughout this chapter. Um, verse number, where are we at, 11? Yeah, 11. But you are they that forsake the Lord that forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for that troop and that furnish drink offering unto that number. We'll come back to those two words in a second. So you have this contrast here. You have this beautiful cluster of grapes that are good. I'm going to preserve them. I'm not going to destroy everything because I've got some good there. Well, okay, well, what about the rest of them? Well, I've got this good here that I'm going to give this beautiful land. Uh-huh, but what about the rest of them? And I'm going to give them this fertile place to dwell and their sheep will lie down. Everything will be prosperous. Uh-huh, okay. What about the rest of them? Well, they have forsaken the Lord. In other words, they have forsaken the goodness he's been promising these over here. It's not that he's like, I've got this exclusive club and you're not invited. The whole world has been invited. They've said no thanks. They've said it over and over. They've said it by turning to pagan gods. And there's been this faithful small few, this very small remnant that has always been faithful to God, has been reliant on God when everyone around them was trusting in idols and pagan worship. And God says, that's my little cluster of grapes. I'm going to put them over here and plant them and they're going to be prosperous in the Messianic age. These guys rejected me. Spanking did not work. Timeout does not help. So off they will go. They forgot my holy mountain. They forsook the Lord. Now my Bible says they prepare a table. That's a fellowship metaphor. For that, mine says, troop and furnish a drink offering for that number. Do you have different words there at the end of verse 11? Who set a table for fortune and filled cups of mixed wine for destiny? Uh, anybody have fortune and destiny or things like that? Or fate maybe even? Those words, mine, it's just, it's a, what they are is they're, they're names of pagan gods. The god of fortune and the god of fate or destiny or something like that. And you can translate that word very literally and you can get different translations out of it. And so mine is, it's, it loses that in the translation. That makes it more literal. But it's, it's a play on words though. It's what God is doing. He's saying, my people have turned away and forsaken me and they've turned to the god of good luck. Well, they're not going to get good luck. The only luck they're going to get is bad luck. They're going to get bad fortune because I'm going to level them and destroy them. So you embrace a God of superstition and the real God will let you hear about it. Verse 12. Therefore will I, and again, there's a play on words here because mine says, will I number you with the sword? So what is destiny. You? Destiny. You see, it's the same play on words. You pray to the false God of destiny. Here's your destiny, God says, the sword. You want, you want fortune? Your fortune. I'm reading your fortune. I can tell your fortune. It's bad because I'm coming for you. The only one who can actually tell the future can tell you I'm coming for you. And it'd be true because he is. Therefore, I will give you destiny, the sword. And you shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear. Instead, you did evil before my eyes. And you chose that wherein I delighted not. This is not the people who are the very prosperous ones over here. These are the rest, those who forsook and those who rejected. This is just God being a thorough judge, telling the condemned why they're condemned. Here's what you didn't do. Here's what you did that you shouldn't have done. That's you. I called for you. He called for them repeatedly with prophet after prophet. He called for them repeatedly with inspired document after inspired document. So he told them, he showed them, he presented it to them, and they rejected, they laughed, they scoffed, they killed. Everyone and everything that he sent got so bad at some point they were finding old documents telling them how to, how to live right and they were carving it up with a knife and tossing it into a fire. Well, that's how you want to be 
So be it. It's when you have a when you have a puppy. You know, if you've ever had a, a brand new puppy, and you can see your puppy chewing on your shoe, and you can shout at your dog, and you can scream at that dog, but that dog does not care that you're screaming at it because that shoe tastes too good. Eventually, you can train the dog, you can teach the dog, but sometimes some dogs just don't want to be taught. They're going to keep chewing that shoe. That's just a stubborn animal. Judah is a dog that's chewing on God's shoe, and God has screamed at them, and God has shouted at them, and God has pleaded for them, and they just don't listen. They just don't care, so they just need a kick in the butt, and that's what they're going to get. Verse 13. I'm not condoning animal cruelty, but kick your dog in the butt every now and then. <laughs> verse 13. And we libel them on camera. All right, verse 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat over here, but you shall be hungry. My servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. My servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. They're all Israelites. They are all Judeans. They are all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are all born into the covenant as a result of that. And yet God only designates the faithful as his servants. Servant is not a derogatory word. You can use it derogatorily. You can use not just the word but the idea behind it in a negative or sinful way. But the notion of it in and of itself is not derogatory. Or derogatory. God says, these are my servants. That's a blessing. Why? Because to be a servant is to be one who follows a master. And God is the master. When you follow him, reward comes with it. When you obey him, blessings follow. You want to be a servant. That's, a, that's not a badge of honor because that's pride. But that's a position of blessing to be a servant of God. God holds it up as a thing to be esteemed. He lifts up his servants. They are going to be fed. They are going to be given drink. But you over here, you wicked ones, you're not my servants. You chose not to be a servant. And so you're going to be hungry. You're going to be thirsty. They're going to rejoice and you're going to be ashamed. A word which the Bible uses repeatedly to mean uh, let down, disappointed, having expectations, having hope, expecting something good and then... They're going to have high hopes, and then they're going to be dashed because they didn't trust in God. Verse 14, Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you, wicked, shall cry for sorrow of heart, and you shall howl for vexation of spirit. Two sounds. They're going to make one sound. You're going to make two different sounds. Their sound is the sound of triumphant singing. Victory is, is mine. Salvation is here. Redemption is ours. When they are crying and howling. They are weeping and shouting with pain. Emotional, physical, psychological. They've lost everything. They're in darkness. 15. And you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay you and call his servants by another name. They are all Israelites. They are all Judeans. They are all born into a covenant relationship with God. But God, what he's showing you in this text, is how he is separating out from his chosen, his chosen. How he is separating out from his people, his people. How he is taking from his nation and carving out of his nation, a nation. He is taking the Israelite people, but they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. There's going to be people who never were of that covenant, who were never born of that Abrahamic relationship, who were never Israelite by birth or by creed or by religious affiliation or by ethnicity or by regional uh, connection. They were never Israelite, but because they will belong to God through the Messiah, they will be of a spiritual Israel. And there will be those who are physically Israel, who are actual descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, born of that covenant, but they will no longer get to be called the children of God. They will no longer be Israel. That's Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, by the way, which is why we're going to study Romans this fall. It's a perfect companion to this. But this verse is really kind of the whole book of Isaiah in a nutshell. Look again at what he says. You're going to leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord will slay you and call his servants by another name. You have, in this one verse, Judah is the prophecy of Judah going into captivity, dying unfaithfully in exile, and the remnant coming back home to receive the Messiah and, and get salvation through him. That's the whole book of Isaiah condensed down to this one little text here in a nutshell. Verse 16. That he who blesses himself in this earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that swears in the earth will now swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, because they are hid from my eyes. This is kind of the last thought here before we move on to something slightly different in verse 17. But he's basically saying he who blesses himself in the earth is now going to have something better to be blessed. 
by and to bless himself. He won't bless himself. He himself will bless the Lord and be blessed by the Lord. Those who are looking for something great in this life, those who are looking to rely on something in this life, will find something better to rely on in God. When you turn to God, your troubles are forgotten, hid from the eyes of God. If you remember, I don't know if it was last week, maybe the week before that, um, God was talking about how uh, he's been keeping receipts. I've seen every sin you've ever done. I've taken notes on it so I can tell you exactly what you've done and why you're being punished. God's a note taker. He's written down every single thing you've ever done that's ever been bad against him. That's a terrifying thought because his memory is perfect. But the moment you repent, it's gone. It's like it never even happened. In his own perfect mind, he just sets it aside. And he says, it's no longer held against you. Stricken from the record book held by God. Brethren will still hold it against you. The world will still hold record against you. Fine. And sometimes your sins have consequences. You must suffer the consequences. But God will not hold it against you. What a blessing and a comfort that is. Verse 17. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. This is God saying, I'm starting over. I've got this whole nation over here. I'm carving out for myself my own people, and I'm going to put them in this new place. Earlier in this chapter, he talked about Sharon. He talked about the Valley of Achan, which are Judean regional areas, the uh, Canaanite regional areas. Well, that's what they're familiar with. That's what they can associate it with. But that is not God promising the actual physical landmass. Here is the geo coordinates of it. And this is where you carve out exactly where God's land is. No, that's premillennial nonsense. It's not God's people are going to live in a certain place in this world. It's that anyone in this world can dwell with God because wherever you are, God is a spirit, and you can worship him in spirit and in truth. So you can belong to this new, uh, perfect spiritual kingdom because it is not constrained and confined to borders and national lines. I'm carving out a people from that sort of mentality and giving them something spiritual. I'm creating something new. I'm starting over. I'm creating a new heavens and a new earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here is Genesis 1-1 redux. I am creating a new heavens and a new earth. And that former is gone. I don't remember it anymore. It is not even coming into my mind anymore. Somebody read Revelation 21 verse 2. Revelation 21 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is a spiritual Jerusalem dwelling on a spiritual Mount Zion, dwelling in a spiritual Can promised land of Canaan, dwelling in a spiritual earth under spiritual heavens. It's a new heavens. God is not blowing up the earth to create a new earth. He's not going to blow up the sky to make a new sky. He's not blowing up Jerusalem to make a new Jerusalem. It's a spiritual Jerusalem. It is metaphysical. It doesn't have to be held down by what this world has. It is spiritual. You belong to it right now. The new heavens and new earth exist right now. May 3rd, 649, here in Batesville, Arkansas. And just like it does anywhere else in this world where there is God's people, they are in the new heavens and new earth. They are in the kingdom of the Messiah. That's the point here. That's the prophecy here. Those former things... That old way of living where if you want to belong to God's people, you got to be of this birthright. you got to be born into this covenant physically. you got to belong in this region. you got to go sacrifice these animals. you got to go up to this mountain. you got to pray at this altar. All those sort of things. God says, that's done. Wiped away. It's done its job. It's expired. No need for it anymore. It is legally abolished. And that's an important distinction. Because otherwise, by the time it comes, the Jews would have balked. At the notion that so now now the seventh day is no longer a legally required day of rest. That's right. Now now we get to eat pigs. That's right. Now we have to stop doing animal sacrifices. That's right. If it wasn't legally abolished, it would just be chaos. And no one would know what to do. But it was legally done away with and something new came into its place. Incidentally, despite it being legally abolished, there were still many Jews who caused those exact problems. Uh, and that's why the book of Galatians is written. Which is why we're going to study that after Romans this fall. 65, 18. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, the King James says, and her people a joy. I am giving this old Jerusalem a brand new coat of paint. 
If you go down to old Jerusalem at the time of Isaiah, it was a place of sadness, sorrow, bitterness, anger, wailing, crying, griping, because in this whole time period leading up to the exile, Jerusalem was not a happy place to be. But God says, I'm going to make this new Jerusalem, and it's going to be just joy all the time. People are going to be happy, celebrating, rejoicing, lifting up their voices in song. I'm going to create this people who are not dour and sad and grim and glum and saying, oh, woe is us, the end is nigh. The end is nigh for that Jerusalem. Babylon's coming. But my new Jerusalem will have a people who have joy on their hearts and on their lips. It will not be a sad thing when the old Jerusalem is done away with. And even though it's not really the point, it, it plays into it. It works perfectly. It worked out really well like this because it was. I don't think it was ever like a direct thing that God planned. Although, who am I to say that? I'm, I'll be wrong probably when I, when I go to heaven and I ask him about it. But I don't know if it was like a thing God was directing directly to happen or if it's just one of those things that just happens by, by the will of men. But Jerusalem is destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans. It really had no direct effect on the kingdom of Christ. But it had a tremendous effect on the Jews. Because when their temple was destroyed and the records of the temple were destroyed and the altar was destroyed, they lost the means. God's old people lost the means to go up to the temple to offer their sacrifices, to offer the Yom Kippur sacrifice every day of atonement, to, uh, to have the record books that told them what their tribe is, what their lineage is. Now they have to just remember that. If it gets lost, it gets lost. You can't go look it up. Who's my ancestor? Is it, is it Asher or Dan or, or Judah or whoever? You don't know. You lose that. You lose the connection that you have with your tribe. And it's just all these things were wiped off the map when Titus sacked Rome. Meanwhile, the church is just thriving. And there were Christians in Jerusalem that knew to get out of Dodge, but there were Jews in Jerusalem who stayed to the end and were slaughtered en masse. And once that happened, they lost the means to worship God the way they had always worshipped God before, permanently. They go to exile, they come out of exile, they build a new temple. Where's the new temple? They, Rome sacked Jerusalem in AD 70, 2,000 years ago. Still no temple. There's a mosque there on it now. They're not getting their temple back. They're not building another altar. They're not reinstituting, reinstituting Yom Kippur. So what do they do every fall when it's time for the Day of Atonement? They have a spiritual sacrifice. They have spiritual atonement. Well, no, that's, that's Jesus' thing. You can't take that. You can't have a spiritual atonement. You can't have a spiritual sacrifice. It's already been done. You've got to get a new Messiah. But you can't. There's only, you only get the one. So they, they, if to do things their way, the way it's supposed to be done under their system, they need an actual lamb, they need an actual altar, they need an actual uh, uh, most holy place, and they don't have those things anymore. It was taken away. But Christians, we have what we have because it's spiritual. Verse 19. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. Look at the, look at the um, uh, connection that you have with God. Previous verse. I'm going to create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. So who is rejoicing? The city. Who has joy? The people. Verse 19. I, God says, will rejoice in Jerusalem and I will joy in my people. There's a connection there. I am rejoicing and I have joy. God says, and I'm rejoicing with you and I have joy with you. And the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her. The voice of crying shall no more be heard. If you could have heard Jerusalem, if you could have stood on the mountain and just your ear perched and listened as Babylon sacked the city and watched the bloodshed, the horror that followed, you would never hear a single song of rejoicing unless it was coming from the Chaldeans rejoicing in their victory. It was a, it was a sound of terror and horror and grief. But here he says, Jerusalem, my Jerusalem, this new Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem, no one cries here. There's no more voice of that heard. If you start to cry, he wipes away your tear. If you start to have trouble, he takes them off your back. That's not how it was, but that's how it will be. Verse 20. And there shall no more from here on out be an infant of days, nor an old man that has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. A very poetic verse. So the translations may vary. I want to spend a couple of minutes here on this because it's really beautiful what he says. Think about it like this. The old Jerusalem was a city of man's construction, right? It was an earthly abode for an earthly people. Yes, they were the people of God. They were set apart, but it was all in the physical sense. Um, they were bound him through a law and they physically were connected to him in that way. New Jerusalem, on the other hand, it's a spiritual city. Its residents are spiritual beings. We live in the world, but our lives are not in this world. Our lives are hid with Christ and God, Colossians 3. 
So to explain that, God points out that spiritual beings don't need to concern themselves, among other things, with the harshness of time and the pain that old age brings. A man's life may exceed 100 years, but it's still just an infant of days on the earth. It doesn't matter in the spiritual kingdom. The days are eternal. You can live 100 years. You can live 10,000 years. You can live when you're there 10,000 10, years. It's still just, it's eternity. You don't spend eternity. How many times have we use the phrase, we're going to spend eternity in heaven? You can't spend eternity. There's, there's nothing to spend. Spending implies you have a set amount and you're currently whittling it down. I have a stack of tens and I'm spending it one at a time. There's no spending in eternity. You just are in eternity. So it's you spend 100 years, but it's an infinite of days because you know the, the earth has gone for so long and you're here and you're gone in a little short amount of time. But in heaven, in eternity, it just is. You spiritually just exist. On the other hand, a child of God may live 100 years and it doesn't matter. But a sinner, a sinner may live 100 years and what's he accomplished? A, a, a Christian may live 100 years and a Christian will say, well, 100 years is nothing. I have eternity with God. Whatever I do in that 100 years, I'm just giving to the Lord. A sinner will only have this time that he has on earth. He doesn't have a future. He doesn't have a tomorrow. He doesn't have eternity. He just has what he has in this world. A sinner may live 100 years and he may do a lot of things in that 100 years. He may build so many buildings and he may employ so many people. He may have so many riches. He may go to so many ball games. Whatever he does in his 100 years, that's all he gets. And then what? It's wasted. We look at a person who lives to be 100 years and we say, wow, what a life. Well, it's a wasted life if it's not lived with God. It doesn't matter that it's 100. He can live to be 500. He can live to be 10,000. If he's not living with God, he will die. And then what? Then it's all for nothing. It's all wasted. A child can live 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old is still a 100-year-old sinner. You lived 110 years. You do all these amazing things that make people say, wow. But at the end of it, you're still a 110-year-old accursed person. And that's no way to live. And it's certainly no way to die. Verse 21. And in the spiritual Jerusalem, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. It's, again, it's metaphor. How do you describe a city that is prosperous and peaceful? You show the people farming. Because if a city is under attack, there's no time for farming. There's no sense to worry about farming because if I'm going to cultivate this land, it's got to take seasons to grow. But if we're attacked all the time, they're going to come in, they're going to scorch the land, they're going to destroy the land. I can't, I can't farm. But a, a city that can farm and a city that can rest and a city that can cultivate is a city that knows its tomorrow is secure. That's the spiritual city in which you live. You get to farm there. I, I, grew, I don't know if you know this. I grew up on a farm. I have no interest in farming. Okay, But the metaphor is... Peace, being at rest, not worrying about tomorrow. Nobody who farms, everybody who farms knows, well, okay, yeah, there's always a sense of, I hope this will grow, I don't know if it's going to grow, but that, you got to think bigger picture than that. Nobody living in an environment where they may have their land ransacked tomorrow is going to bother planting seeds. But in the spiritual kingdom of Christ, plant your seeds. Because no one's coming to ransack. No one's coming to eat the fruit of your vineyards. No one's going to come in and steal your land, and steal your crops, or anything else. I think I think there's something to say too about like there's purpose in having like a job. Like even in on the earth, you can see people that are unhappy that are you know don't have a job. There's no way to provide all this stuff. But when you have a purpose, and like you were talking about earlier about the servant, like when you have someone to serve and a purpose in it and like peace that that person's going to take care of you or that job's going to take care of you. It's kind of, I mean, that's talking spiritual, but even in real life, like people that are lost, don't have a job, don't have purpose. I mean, even you can see their earthly life, like they're sad. Like if people that don't have purpose are sad spiritually or physically, I mean, it models each other, I think. Yes, that's a very good point. Thank you. Um, 22, 65, 22. They shall not build and another inhabit. This is what's not going to happen. You're not going to build this beautiful land for yourself and then some foreign nation come in and kick you out and take your land for you. These, these are things that are actually going to happen for the Judeans. And it hasn't happened yet when Isaiah's writing, right? So they're going to read this, they're going to experience it, and then they're going to go back and read it again and think, I don't have to go through that again. I don't have to worry about some foreign power coming in and dragging me out of the spiritual kingdom of the Messiah because they can't get in there. The spiritual people, uh, sinful people aren't allowed in there. 
So they will, you're not going to build and someone else inhabit it. You're not going to plant and someone else eat it. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. What was the first thing that God told, to go along with what Abby was talking about, what is the first thing that God told Adam and Eve to do when he made them? The first thing he told them was not, don't touch that tree. The first thing he told them was, get to work. Here is the garden. Go tend it and keep it. Name those animals. He gave them jobs to do. He gave them tasks. Imagine if he hadn't. If he created this huge garden, placed them in the middle of it and said, I have nothing for you to do. Just don't touch that tree. Like they would have touched that tree within five minutes because that's all they know to do. But instead, God set them to task to do positive things. Don't touch that tree. Meanwhile, name all these animals. Tend and keep this garden. Do all these things. He gave them purpose. He gave them tasks. He gave them meaning. It will be like that in the spiritual realm. It will be like that in the spiritual kingdom. And I shouldn't even say will be. It should be like that right now because you're in it right now. You should have tasks to accomplish. You should have a job to do. You're not working your way to heaven. You're working on your way to heaven. It's always been from the beginning. Adam and Eve were put to work while they were living forever with God. You should be working while you're living forever with God. Don't wait till you dead in the ground to live for God. That's retirement. You work now. Then you go on the ground. Well, uh, yeah, right. You can ret- Yeah. I'm still young and in my prime. I'm not thinking about retirement. Um, so somebody read Romans 8, 35 through 39. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we are overwhelmingly, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All of that in Isaiah is, for as the days of the tree are the days of my people. How long does a tree live? They get bigger and they get more humongous and they sprout more fruit and they cultivate and they take care of more people around them. That will be how my people are. And my elect shall enjoy that work with no one coming to take it away from them, with no one coming to to disrupt it, you will be protected, you will be cared for, so that you can work in peace. 23. 65, 23. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring is with them. Somebody please go back to Isaiah 53 and read verse number 10. Isaiah 53, 10. That is the will of the Lord to crush them. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see his offspring, or seed. So the seed of the seed, 6523. The, the, the people of the Messiah will not labor in vain. The people of the Messiah will not bring forth trouble because they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord. You are the offspring of the Son of God. You are the children of God through the Messiah. You are the adopted ones into the family of God by means of Jesus' sacrifice. You're the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring is with them. This perpetuation of life with God. You have a chance to live in the paradise garden with God, to work in the paradise garden for God, and to serve and live with God forevermore. Do not wait for you to die to go to your paradise. I know we use that terminology, and there's nothing wrong with using that terminology, and in some ways it's perfectly appropriate and fine. But I don't want you to think when someone, a Christian dies, we say, this brother has died, but they're in paradise. Okay, that's true. But when I hear the word paradise, I don't want you to think um, paradise garden Eden. Because the Paradise Garden Eden today, the spiritual Garden of Eden today, is the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is Eden today. Man had it, man lost it. Why? Because they sinned. What did Jesus do? Washed away their sins. Well, if my sins are washed away, I get to go back in. 
I get to have paradise again, except it's not a physical location anymore where there's an angel with a sword guarding and all that kind of stuff. It's not physical trees for me to physically tend to and physical animals for me to physically name. It's a spiritual garden. It's a spiritual paradise that I get to enjoy with the Son of God. I get to walk and talk with Him like Adam and Eve did, except I do it in a spiritual way, whereas they did it in a more physical way. The church of Christ is Eden. That's it. It's the tree of life. It's walking and talking with God. It's fellowship with God. It's living forever. That's what you have. That's what you have. And God assures his people that when you work for me, your labor will not be in vain. It wasn't in vain for Adam until he blew it. It's not in vain for us unless we do too. 65.24 And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are speaking, I will hear. I want to read that again because I didn't put the right inflection on that. Put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Look at 65.24. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're speaking, I will hear. Do you ever, you ever call to God? Do you ever shout out to God? You don't have to actually physically shout. Though. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you're offering your prayer to God, and you bow your head and you say, Lord, before you even say what you need, he's already working on it. Before you even say what you need, he's already sending it your way, if that's his will. So it's before they call, I'm already answering. While they're still speaking, I'm already listening. That's a stark contrast to what he said about his people before. My people speak and speak and speak, but I'm not listening. Why? Because they they're not speaking from the heart. They, they waited to the last minute, in fact, past the last minute, they waited till past zero hour, and now they're already being punished, and now they want to cry for deliverance. No, 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 the bridge has passed. The ship has sailed. But now my people, who are faithful and being blessed by me, I hear them before they're even done talking. I'm, I'm already answering before they're done speaking. 65.25. And in this paradise of God's people, in this messianic kingdom in which we today get to live, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion eats straw like the bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Again, back in chapter 2, Isaiah is talking about the people of God, and he says they hammered down their swords and turned them into plowshares. You take your weapons of war, and you turn them into weapons of harvesting. I'm a Christian. My enemy is the world. Well, my enemy is the devil. The devil's soldier are the people of the world. But my job is not to kill my enemy. My job is to convert my enemy. It's not to stab them. It's to harvest them. It's to reap them. The fields are white. Get to reaping. He didn't say the fields are full of bad guys. Get to killing. Jesus said the fields are white for the harvest. Get to reaping. Because that's what you do. You save them. Now, granted, you save them by putting them to death. But then you raise them up to walk in newness of life. So then they become on your side. They join your team. But look at what he says in this paradise he's talking about. How peace reigns. A wolf and a lamb eat together instead of one being eaten by the other. Whereas a lion would physically, naturally eat a bullock, a, a small uh, goat or calf. Now the lion is eating the straw like the bullock. And dust is the serpent's meat. Instead of snapping and putting his fangs in your ankle, it's eating the dust of the ground. No one is hurting. No one is destroying in all my holy mountain. I'm tired and so weary, but I must go on till the Lord comes and calls me away. Will the, uh, will the, how's it go? Oh, I'm trying to hear it. I can hear it in Elvis' voice, and I could do a pretty fair invitation, but I won't. I'll spare you that. Thank you. Where the, yeah, uh, <laughs> where the land is so bright, and the lamb is the light, and the night is as bright as the day. I think that's how it goes. And there will be peace in the valley for me. Peace in the valley, oh Lord, I pray. Uh, there will be no sadness, no sorrow, no trouble. Trouble I see. There will be peace in the valley for me. Sounds beautiful. Pretty, pretty, pretty. When Elvis sings it in 1957 on Ed Sullivan, sounds beautiful. But the song is wrong! It is not there will be peace. There should already be peace. You should already be in the valley. Don't wait till you're dead to get to the valley. The valley is now. The invitation is join the valley now. Get peace in the valley now. But you, but you say, well, you have trouble and sorrow now. So how can you say there'll be no trouble and sorrow now? Yes, I have trouble and sorrow now. And when I have my sorrow, God wipes away my tears. And when I have troubles, I give them to him so they're not mine anymore. I mean, they're my troubles, but he's holding them. First Peter 5, 7. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. I've got all these cares, and I'm just tossing them to him because they're too heavy for me, but he can take them all. So there are no troubles because he's holding them. There are no sorrows because he's wiping them away. There is a wolf lying down with a lamb. There is sheep and lion and, and, and predator animals just sleeping together, lying next to each other in peace and harmony and fellowship. Why? Because that's the name of the game in the kingdom of Christ. Peace. Not war. Peace. Not fighting. Resolution. No longer in conflict with God, but at peace with God. A wolf and a lamb are natural enemies. 
And now they're friends. Now they're at peace. Sort of like Jew and Gentile, if you want to connect that to Galatians 3, which is why we're going to study Galatians later this fall. All right. That's it. That's the end of the chapter.